Let's open our Bibles tonight to Genesis chapter 7, as we continue our journey through my favorite book in the Bible, the book of Genesis. Tonight we're going to look at two chapters, chapter 7 and 8. It is the flood and the beginning of the new world. It is a frightening chapter to think of God's judgment being so vast. But after creation and the establishment of marriage, after the fall of man and the ungodly line of Seth, that, I'm sorry, of, of Cain that we followed, and then the godly line of Seth for a time, 1656 years passed between chapter 3 and chapter 7, between the fall and the flood. We looked at, for the last couple of weeks as what the days of Noah looked like, the development of man, the population explosion due to the the average lifespan being 910 years prior to the flood, the increase of sinfulness and violence with men, the odd incidences of cohabitation of fallen angels with men that led to a race of, of giants. We read that in chapter 6. And then the whole world was headed for this place where it was ripe for God's judgment. We met Noah. A, a, the, the word Noah means to rest. Noah found a grace with God in his heart, and so did his family, and God promised to deliver him and his family from the wrath to come. God commanded Noah to build an ark. It would take him 120 years to build it. He would build it faithfully over those years, according to what we read in Hebrews as well. Noah warned the nation, the people of God's judgment to come. He built by faith, he had no boat building experience. He constructed this boat to, <laughs> to his salvation, if you will, um, as he cried out to man to repent. He built it miles away from any water source. He warned of a flood that was coming when it had never rained. He trusted the Lord. Hebrews 11 verse 7 said he, he believed God. He was divinely warned of things not seen as yet. So he was moved with a godly fear. And so isn't that a lot of your story and mine? We are warned by the Lord of what is coming, the good and the, and the judgment, and we are to be moved by a godly fear. We believe what God had to say. Very little is told to us in the Bible anywhere about these 120 years besides what you read in chapter 6. But we arrive in chapter 7 at the end of the building period for Noah, at the end of God's cry to men to repent and to turn to him by faith, that we come to the end of this world as Noah and his family knew it, and we arrive at the beginning of a new world. Noah walked with God, Noah worked with God, and so soon Noah would worship God in this new place, as we'll read at the end of chapter 8. So, the flood tonight. By the way, the flood runs into much criticism from commentators and theologians who would like to ignore it altogether, or make it a metaphor, or limit it to some kind of a, a regional, if you will, flood. It's impossible to limit it to that, certainly, uh, in more ways than one. The Bible clearly tells a different story. Back to chapter 6, verse 17, the Lord's declaration was, Behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters upon the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh which is in, it, in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. That doesn't sound like a local flood. In chapter 7, verse 4, verse 18, 19, 20, chapter 8, verse 21 as well, God spoke about this universal flood and its extent. We learned last week of this massive boat that Noah was directed to build. It was 450 feet long. It was 75 feet wide. It was 45 foot high. And, and God would use it to cause Noah and his family to survive this worldwide flood and provide salvation, if you will, deliverance for the animals that God would bring to Noah and his family as well. If this flood did not happen, then God is a liar. And Jesus as well, as he spoke there in Luke to the 
Uh, disciples, he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. They ate and they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage till the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, it was like that in the days of Lot. They ate and drank, they bought and sold, they planted and built until the day that Lot came out of Sodom and fire and brimstone came from heaven and destroyed them all. So also shall it be when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus is lying if this flood did not take place. Peter is lying if this flood did not take place. He wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3 that, the, that, that Christ suffered once for our sins, for the just, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who were formerly disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through the water. Both referred to these days before the flood, saying that in the last days the judgment of God will once again catch many, most, unaware. That life will go on to the very day that the Lord comes, and that we will then, you know, stand before God and give an account. For us it would be, you know, a welcome day. For the world, it will overtake them for sure. As we mentioned to you, I think back in chapter 1, most people refuse the idea of God's creation of the heaven and the earth because if they believe that, then everything that comes with it, you have to then make yourself accountable for. So you'll have to answer to God. If there is a God who is able to do all of these things, then his demands have to be answered. His, his word has to be taken into consideration. The same thing is true of a worldwide flood. If it actually happened and destroyed all of man's kind except for eight people, then again, God is holy. Man is not. God can't be stopped. He's, he's, he's supreme. We need to bow before him and seek his face. And if not, we're left to consider our lives. How are we going to deal with a God that's able and capable of doing the very thing that we read here when he created us to have fellowship with him? Most of these chapters early on in the, in the book of Genesis are very clear and they're very straightforward. They're, they're difficult, almost impossible to misunderstand. There was a worldwide flood that would cover the entire globe we're going to read tonight. The water would go as far as 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain peak and every single human being would die except for eight. Noah, his family, his wife, three sons and three and their wives. It's eight in all. They, along with the animals that God brought to them, would survive on this boat <clears throat> for over a year, 371 days to be exact. They would become the nucleus from which God would repopulate a reconstructed earth as the flood would, would absolutely change the anatomy, if you will, of the earth. In fact, the earth where Noah lands in chapter 8 uh, will be, and where his family steps off, will be the land that you know today. The, the things that we know today, the mountains, the, the valleys, they would all have been formed by them. So tonight we get straightforward kind of talk from the Lord, even as all of these things we've spoken, uh, spoken about the last few weeks uh, come to pass and are recorded for us. It is, it is unbelievable to think so many people meet this kind of judgment, but it should verify in your hearts that God is holy, and he provides plenty of opportunity for you to be right with him. And if you're not, he'll have the last word. And unfortunately, some people laugh that off, but it's no laughing matter. Verse 1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And you shall take with you seven, each of every clean animal, a male and a female, two of each animal that are unclean, a male and his female, all seven, each of the birds, also seven each, sorry, of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive upon the face of the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. 
So the Lord invites Noah and his family into the ark a week before the start of the rain. It is repeated again in verse 4, again I think in verse 10, that these seven days passed. And, and Noah obediently gets into the boat with his family. The ark had been built for stability. Its purpose was to carry this precious cargo through the worst of storms. And after 120 years, which we just kind of skip over between chapter 6 and 7, God gives Noah a seven-day notice. He told him 120 years would be the length of time man would still be able to right, get right with God. Now it's down to seven. I love verse four, or, or verse one, excuse me. I love the, the invitation God gives to Noah and his family. Come in the ark. I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. This is the first time God invites someone in the Bible to come and follow him. It's not the last time, but it is the first. The Lord said through Isaiah to the people, come, let us reason together. He said to the disciples, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And in the end of the book, the book of Revelation 22, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And everyone who hears can come. And let him, if he's thirsty, come. If you desire, come and drink the waters of life freely. God's always interested in you coming. <laughs> always. If you don't think you have a place with him tonight, know this. He'd like you to come. You have an invitation. Here you go. Come. That's what he wants you to do. Where the Lord invites all men to escape his coming judgment and his invitation is to come. Jesus is certainly man's ark. If you want a spiritual picture, here's the ark, which would deliver a righteous man who believed in God from the judgment of God to come. Jesus takes your wrath at Calvary. He saves those who look to him. And in entering the ark, Noah and his family would find salvation. They would be preserved, but unfortunately they would still have to experience this great cataclysmic event that was to take place upon the earth. Having said that, I would rather be in the Lord than out there on my own. There's that scripture in Isaiah 43 where the Lord says, uh, Jacob, I formed you. Israel, don't be afraid. I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You belong to me. If you pass through the water, I'll be with you. If you find yourself in the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you walk through the fire, it won't burn you, nor will the flame scorch you. I'm with you. So come, says the Lord to Noah and his faithful family. Get in the ark. The judgment is coming, and I've come to deliver you. Remember when Jesus was sleeping in the boat there, and the storm came up in the Sea of Galilee, I think it's Mark chapter 4, and the Lord was tired. He'd been at it all day. He was snoring, but it was a bad storm. And so the boys, and when fishermen start to worry about drowning, you know it's a bad storm. They went to wake him up. Lord, don't you care? We're dying over here. And the Lord said, really? I thought I said to you, we'll go over to the other, other side. Not under to the other side. And he, he kind of chastised them for their lack of faith and calmed the seas. And you know, Look, if Jesus is on board, you can rest. That's for sure. So Noah would be in the ark with his family and a gamey kind of smelling group of animals for 371 days. And from all that we read, and we can only ascertain what we have by what God gives us, it would have been a rough boat ride. Not just rain, but like the, the, the fountains of the deep just gurgling up the waters, you know, and, and the land masses moving. I, I just can't imagine getting your sea, sea legs, you know. I bought a boat years ago because I got really seasick in the ocean. I'm not good at oceans. But I said, well, if I get a boat, I'll have the key. And when I don't feel good, I'll just move. It didn't work. Oh, I got to move, but the minute I stopped, oh, it's terrible again. It was just seasick, and I just got rid of the stupid thing. I blamed the boat, but I think it was me. <laughs> my, my worst fishing story, we had a bunch of brothers in a men's ministry at Calvary Downey years ago, wanted to go on this all-night fishing deal out of Mexico. And so I said, oh, yeah, I'll go. About two hours in, we hit this storm or something. I fell into the bait tank. I know. Trying to run to the 
you know, to help myself over the edge. And I looked out, and the guys were eating macaroni and cheese. And I was so sick for a day and a half, and I, I, I hated every one of those guys. You'll, you'll just, you'll make bargains with God when you're that sick on a boat. You never, you, you know, you'll promise anything. It was horrible. And I thought, no one with all these, oh, how could it have been, you know? He had to go through it. But come on to the ark, because I have seen that you're righteous before me. Noah was different. Noah was different. He walked with, a, with God in a culture that would not. He pleased the Lord in a world that was ripening around him for judgment. That sounds like the church today. It certainly feels like it to me. Things have never gotten so bad around us. But he was singular in his devotion. And I have to believe that though the Bible says very little, it must have been extremely difficult for 120 years to be at this job with the, the likes of people's opinions. How must he have suffered along with them? Just imagine the opposition he faced about what he was doing, how he tried to explain that rain was coming, though they'd never seen, seen it, o obeying God because that's what God wanted to, to him to do. He was the only one. No one else was really joining. And his family, that was it. He was a true nonconformist. And I think the church should be a true nonconformist as well. Peer pressure is real pressure. <laughs> Kids have it. Teenagers get it. Adults, wives, politicians as well. I remember growing up in the late 60s in the hippie days, and I thought I was a true nonconformist. But in reality, looking back, I just surrounded myself with people who felt like I did and then said we were cool, nobody else. Long hair, torn jeans, drugs everywhere. You know, that's the, we were, we've dropped out. <laughs> no, we just ran with a different crowd. Want to be a real nonconformist? Walk with Jesus. And don't let this world and its ways affect you. That was Noah. Come, Noah, you've been righteous in a world about to be destroyed. You've been faithful. That's what we want to hear. It is after all this wicked generation of the days of Noah that Jesus said would, would, would characterize for us the last generation that would be waiting for him to return. And I hope that's us. According to verse 1, verse 4, and I think verse 10 as well, Noah and his families boarded a week early. They sat, they waited, the door was way too large for them to close. It wasn't built for him to close it. They, they, they just sat and probably survived the mocking Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Can you imagine? All week, people driving by, you know, making comments. And then it began to rain. You and I are waiting for Jesus to come. Tell somebody that and see how they laugh. You're what? I'm waiting for Jesus to come. I'm waiting for Jesus to come. We'll just sit and wait, won't we? We'll sit and wait. We was to bring seven pairs of clean animals, two of the unclean, seven pairs of birds, to preserve that species. We know that the, from the Lord tells us here in a few minutes that uh, the Lord brought the animals, actually, I, that was in chapter 6, the Lord brought the animals to Noah, they will come to you, verse 20 of chapter 6. But Noah had, to, Noah had to prepare food for them all. That was his responsibility. The extra pair of clean animals were used for the sacrifice to the Lord when the new world would begin and provided uh, the eating of meat, which the Lord would finally allow and even mandate after the flood had taken place. Up to now, everybody was a vegetarian, but that was about to change. So we read in verse 5, and Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters were upon the earth. So Noah with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean animals and of, of animals that were unclean, of birds and everything that creeped, creeped upon the earth. Two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. So the loading time this last week begins. The final testimony to this generation who walks with mocking hearts, I guess, and just life went on as usual, nothing to see here. Sitting in the ark with every one of his family as the animals pulled in, a week with still no rain, 
they rested and they waited and they believed God one last week for the world to turn to him. God's patience at its end. But they would not turn to him. Paul would write to the Romans years later, do you despise the riches of God's goodness and his forbearance and his long-suffering, knowing that the goodness of God is to lead you to repentance? Or if you will, God is just patient. 120 years. Have you ever waited for anybody for 120 years? Oh, no, you have not. We just haven't even lived that long. Just imagine the opposition he faced and the difficulty he must have been facing as well. So they waited. Verse 10 tells us, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month and the 17th day of the month, on that day, all of the fountains of the great deep were broken up. The windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth for 40 days and for 40 nights. As we will notice, there is probably no other biblical event in the, in the Bible, obviously, biblical event, um, that as, is as comprehensively dated as the flood, its length of time, the day that it started, the time that it ended and all. Um, probably the, the thing that is most, or is even more exacting, if you will, is the second coming of Jesus. Once the rapture takes place, I'll tell you what day it comes. Because the Bible tells us very clearly that we can count ahead from that day. But other than that, this is about the most documented um, event, if you will, in the Bible. Imagine the destructiveness of floodwaters when it isn't just raining for nearly six weeks, but the waters under the firmament. You remember as the creation came, this pressure of the breaking up of the fountains of the deep, water is powerful. I mean, there's no more, you know, it is one of the most powerful things upon the planet. You remember, you probably remember the images of Katrina blowing into New Orleans, especially down in the Ninth Ward, or the, the tsunami in Indonesia that in 2004 that killed, what, 350,000 people? Or the devastating one along the coast of Japan 11 years ago already, after the earthquake that took 19,000 lives. Water is, is frightening. And it certainly came all over the world to bring God's judgment to man. After seven days, on the seven, uh, second month of the 17th, on the seventh day of the 600 year of Noah's life, the flood came. The envelope or canopy of water that surrounded the earth was opened up. The underground fountains of the deep were released and broken and the floods came. The release is such that these great cataclysmic, if you will, upheavals would have permanently changed the topography of the earth. It would have raised up mountain ranges that never existed, lowered valleys and, and basins, turned rivers, changed landscapes. It formed the Grand Canyon and Everest at 29,000 feet, or the Ancacana in, in Ecuador, I think, stands at 23,000 feet. McKinley stands over a little over 20,000 feet. Imagine, all in this year of just upheaval in the earth. And on top of it, poor Noah <laughs> can just imagine. It would have created the deepest oceans. We have the Mariana Trench off the uh, northwest of Pacific Ocean, off the coast of Guam, I think. The uh, Marianne Trust is 36,000 feet deep. I, you might remember that, uh, I think it was James Cameron, the film guy, who did a study and they, they, they tried lowering down into that play of phenomenon. The valley in Israel where the Dead Sea is uh, at 1,400 feet below sea level. Imagine all of the tectonic plates in the, in the earth that have moved as they collapsed or you know, things came up and went down and amazing. I think I mentioned a book to you a while back, but I would mention it to you again. It'll give you hours of reading on this subject. It's called The Genesis Flood. It was written by John Wickham and uh, Henry Morris, uh, two PhDs. One's a scientist, the other one's a theologian, but they get along just fine. I remember years ago, Pastor John MacArthur said that it was one of the most important books of the past century, and I would agree. It's really well done if you want to just spend some time on this particular subject in this particular chapter. In the ark sat Noah, 
his fa- and his family, and a zoo, basically. A zoo of animals that God had brought and the food. By the time Noah departs from the ark, as we will read in chapter 8 in a minute, 371 days have moved forward, and the earth has been washed and cleansed, permanently changed, and man will start again. I can only imagine what Noah went through, both physically and emotionally and spiritually, to think that everyone upon the planet was dead. We read in verse 12, Did I read verse 12 already? I did. I'm not going to read it again then. On that very same day, verse 13, Noah and his Noah's sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and three wives of their sons with him entered the ark. They and every beast in its kind, all the cattle after their kind, every creeping thing uh, creeps upon the earth after its kind, every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah two by two, all of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. But, they, but those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as God commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. Now the flood was upon the earth for 40 uh, days. The waters increased and rose up to the, uh, lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased upon the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the water, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. All of the high hills were under the whole heaven covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits. A cubit is about 18 inches, so 22 and a half feet upward. And the mountains were covered, and the Lord shut them in. Imagine imagine if you've seen the ark and, and you've seen... If you've been to the ark, we took some of you, I think, a few months ago. The, the door was certainly too large for Noah to handle. He, he wasn't told to build a, a mechanism, if you will, to open it. God alone can save, and I think maybe that's the picture. You can cut, you're invited, but God alone can shut you in, right? He can keep you. And according to verse 12, for 40 days and night, it just keep pour, kept pouring uh, water. It picked up the ark. It floated it along the waters went 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain, which, by the way, must may have been much lower then than it is now because there was a temperate climate and all, and there was not much movement. The topography could certainly have changed. We do read that the, the terms greatly increased and prevailed. It was powerful and deadly and overpowering. Verse 21 says, And all of the flesh died that moved upon the earth. Birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils were the breath of the spirit of life, all that was upon the dry land died. And so he destroyed all living things which were upon the face of the earth, both man and cattle, creeping things and birds of the air. They were destroyed from the earth and only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive and the waters prevailed upon the earth for 100 years and 50 days. Everything died. Now the fish survived, but for the rest, only these. And notice in verse 24, the water kept prevailing, or if you will, maintaining its height for five months before it would begin to recede and work its way out for the next 221 days, which is in chapter 8. It was a universal flood, no local flood. But here's the lesson. It is interesting to speak of geography and topography and hydrology. God is much more interested in theology. Everything dies. That was what we read. Perished under his judging hand. And I think this is why people don't want to believe in the the, the truth, because the idea of a universal flood would say that God is holy and God will judge even though there's absolutely such a ton of evidence to know the truth, my heart won't let it grasp the truth so that I don't have to answer to this God that I would be fearful of. He did judge. He will judge. It happened once. It will happen again. It will happen at the end of your life. You'll stand before God. And you'll either have Jesus to stand up next to you and claim you as his own, or you'll stand there alone and find judgment. And it'll happen one 
day at the end of this age when the Lord will destroy heaven and earth with a fire and, a, and an explosion that will just take out everything that we see. The only solution, get on the ark, turn to Jesus, find grace with God as Noah and his family did. We read in chapter 8, verse 1, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all of the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the water or, or the earth, and the waters began to subside. God remembered. <laughs> the Bible is really good at using anthropomorphic uh, language or, or so that we in human terms can begin to understand and, and be able to better relate to God, and especially the attributes of God that are beyond our understanding. When you read God Remembered, we immediately go, did he forget for five months? Was he doing something else? No. God had hardly forgotten his own bobbing in that water for so long, but he remembered in the sense that he now begins to act on their behalf now that this judgment is over and bring back to life the earth that he created and that he has now virtually destroyed. So God made a win <laughs> to begin to blow the waters and the fountains quit emitting their water and the rain quit falling. And after five months, the waters didn't rise or prevail any longer upon the earth. It began to recede, which by the way, is, is the adequate and, and complete explanation for why you find fossils at 10,000 feet and why you find inland seas that have disappeared and all that were once covered. It's the only, it's the only explanation, unless you just want to cover your eyes and stick your head in the sand. At this time, and we will read it down in verse, well, let me read it real quick, verse two. And the, the, the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters began to recede continually from the earth at the end of 150 days, the waters were decreasing, and the ark then rested on the seventh month and the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat, and the waters decreased continually until the 10th month, and in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were clearly seen. So, at the time... At this time, I should say, the ark hits land, the mountains of Ararat, on the seventh month, in the 17th day of the month, which, by the way, just you know, that like to do a lot of Bible studies, is the exact day Jesus would rise from the dead. Passover is on the 14th, three days later, the resurrection. In, in, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, when the Lord gave the religious calendar to his people, the seventh month was changed to become the first month of the religious calendar. It's known as Abib or Nisan, if you will. It was, the, it was because God wanted the religious calendar, the relationship with God, to be the first thing that, that started off the new year, if you will. And so on the 10th day of that month, the, the Passover lamb was secured. It was killed on the 14th. Jesus rose on the 17th day of the seventh month. Pretty interesting, isn't it? So Noah, his name means to rest, and his family and the arks were snagged on the top of some mountains as they began to break through the waters. And for the next two and a half months, verse five, uh, they just kind of sat and floated and kind of bounced around, if you will, uh, not really being moved much, just kind of floating around. Under him, the impossible had taken place the world and those in it were dead. They had survived, and still they have to wait. Mount Ararat today stands at about 16,000 feet. It is in eastern Turkey in the Armenian highlands, if you will, that borders Iraq. And the summit is constantly, in fact, year-round, covered in ice. There's a whole range of mountains, as the scriptures report, there have been reports for generations of a sighting through the ice at about 14,000 feet. In fact, those reports have been coming in since the 5th century of seeing what looked like an ark. Is it there? Seen the pictures? I just believe what the Bible says, but whether you, know, you can see it or not, I have no idea. 
Josephus, who was the Jewish historian, mentions it, and, and many pictures and flyovers have sought to verify it. There have been TV specials and books and, and all. Even Marco Polo <laughs> wrote of it. So did the French explorer Navarro, who wrote, The Ark, I Touched It. That's the name of his book. I have no idea if it's true or not, but I do assume that it's there somewhere. I also assume if man ever get to it, got to it, gets to it, he'll be worshiping it before he's done. So I'm praying the Lord will just keep it on ice because man has a weird way of responding to those kind of things. We read in verse 6, So it came to pass at the end of those 40 days that Noah opened the windows of the ark. <laughs> Probably want to let some air now that it stopped raining which he had made. And then they sent out a raven which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried from the earth. He also sent out for himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove, finding no resting place for the soles of her feet, returned into the ark to him for the waters were still upon the face of the whole earth. And so he drew out his hand and took her and drew her back into the ark. And he waits another seven days and he sends her out again. And the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, freshly picked or plucked olive leaf was in his mouth, and Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. And so he waited yet another seven days and set out the dove, which did not return any more to him at all. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, and in the first day of the month, that the waters were dried upon the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. Noah opened the windows. <laughs> I would have opened the windows. And he began to gaze if the earth was dry. Apparently he couldn't really see the ground from the way that it was positioned. He sent a raven out first. A raven is an unclean animal. So ravens eat carrion and, and dead flesh, and it found plenty of food, and it didn't return. The dove is a clean bird. It requires clean, dry food. No dry land, no dry food. And so it kept returning to him, and he kept sending it out every week. And then one time it returned with a fr fr freshly plucked olive leaf, Things were drying out, and life was returning to the land. Verse 12, seven more days, and the dove is launched a third time, but it doesn't come back. It has always interested me that a, we use as a symbol of peace a dove with an olive branch in his mouth. But in reality, peace came when the dove disappeared. So I don't know how all that works. Verse 13 tells us it was in the seven, 601st year of Noah's life on the first day and the first, uh, first month, first day of the month, that the waters were dried upon the earth, and Noah opened up more of the ark and saw the ground that appeared dry. Now here's the thing, the Lord had not said, get off. You know how we can sometimes just assume? <laughs> Noah's a really good example of obeying the Lord, not asking a lot of questions, just doing what he's told. So he's been in this thing for a year, six days. I'm thinking he's stir crazy. Right? You heard of Ireland fever? This would be Ark fever, wouldn't it? Like, get me out of here. But the Lord says nothing. So Noah waits, waits for 57 more days, almost two months. Verse 14 says, and on the second month, in the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry, and then God spoke to Noah. So for 40, or I should say for 57 more days, Noah just sat waiting upon the Lord. Animals, feeding, sanitation, lovely odors. This word from the Lord would have been most welcome. But look, the Lord shut them in, and the Lord would let them out. And without his guidance, he wouldn't go. Great lesson, isn't it? I know sometimes we think we figured it out. God, this is obvious. God's ways are not so obvious to our flesh. It is important that we find his peace and hear his voice. Well, verse 15, 
we read there, sorry, turn the page. And the Lord spoke to Noah and he said, go out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons and your wives, sons' wives with you. Bring with you every living thing of, the, of all flesh that is with you, the birds and the cattle, every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, so that they may abound upon the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And so Noah went out and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him, every animal, creeping thing, bird, and whatever creeps upon the earth, according to their families, everybody kind of disembarked. Can you hear a hallelujah somewhere in there? And God said to them what he had said to Adam and Eve, go forward and multiply. Replenish the earth. The offloading begins. We read in verse 20, then Noah um, built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird, and he offered them as burnt offerings to the Lord, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I, as I have done. Though long before the Levitical law and, uh, and its codification by Moses, Noah had already learned from the Lord about clean and unclean, and what was needed to offer to the Lord had had to be clean. Leviticus will teach us of the many different types of offerings. If you've gone, we have a whole series of studies on the book of Leviticus. You're welcome to go through them. But it, it does make things very clear that those offerings and the types of them are all pictures of what Jesus would come to do for us and the cost that he would pay. Uh, but for them and for the moment, those offerings were, were coverings. The, the, the Hebrew word is to kofar. It means to cover. And God covered man's sin by the blood of these animals that were shed, who had really not, done nothing on their own. They were dying in our place, if you will, to cover our sin. But Jesus would come to take away our sin. Here it is a burnt offering that is mentioned. A burnt offering, by the time you get to Leviticus, will be an offering of dedication. It isn't God, forgive me of my sins. It is God, take my life and use it as you see fit. It is an offering of, of uh, complete submission and consecration to the Lord. So Noah gets off the ark, falls on his knees, commits himself and his family to the Lord, and he builds an ark. Now, this is the first time that you will find an ark being built. Now, of course, you've been with us for a long time. Um, in Genesis, there's a lot of firsts, obviously. Uh, the biblical law of, of interpreting the Bible called hermeneutics would say that the first time you ever run into anything in the Bible should be your main place of defining what the word or the concept means. And it does bear out. The Lord in, in first mention tends to de define what, what we should then be able to carry forward as we read through the scriptures. So we, we read in verse 1 that God remembered Noah, but here at the end of uh, chapter 8, or yeah, at the end of chapter 8, Noah remembers God. And he goes to the Lord, and he surrenders himself to him. I, I think there's, there's something to be said for our tendency to forget God. It's not so hard to do. We, we tend to believe his promise of great things, and especially when a catastrophe happens. But the minute it is over, he almost gets checked out of our, 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 our collective conscious memory. Uh, maybe the reference would be the, those, those 10 lepers there in Luke 17 that came to Jesus. And, and, and he literally sent them to the priest. And as they went, they were all healed. And yet only one went back to thank the Lord. And, and the Lord's comment, it was, it's in Luke 17, 17. He said, were there not 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? There's something about we take and forget. The Lord remembered Noah. Here, Noah remembered the Lord. God has been good, and he committed himself to the Lord. There's many ways to keep the Lord in mind. Praying every day will keep the Lord in mind. Daily devotions and Bible study will keep the Lord in mind. Getting 
involved in your church or with others to serve will keep the Lord in mind. Putting yourself in positions where you need the Lord to help always keeps him in mind. I think sometimes we forget the Lord because we really don't need to rely upon him. We can live our lives, it seems, without him. But in ministry and service, you can't do that. Uh, it, it is hard because you're busy and it's inconvenient, but if you long for the Lord and you, you, you realize what he has given you, it's not natural to remember, it's natural to forget. It's supernatural to remember. So I, I, that scripture in, in uh, Ecclesiastes, I think it's chapter 12, verse 1, where Solomon writes, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw in when I have to say of my years, I'm not taking any pleasure in them. In other words, develop a, a conscious awareness of God in a relationship with him while things are going good. So that when things are not so good, and, and, and the reference at least from Solomon was the older you get, the, the harder life can be, um, then you don't forget God or turn from him because you've, you've developed a, a conscious awareness of who he is. So the, the quicker you start developing habits that help you remember the Lord, the better off you'll be in the long run. I also like verse 21 where we read the Lord saying he was blessed by the soothing aroma. <laughs> ah! As Noah remembered and sacrificed and set in his own heart. Verse 21. The, while, the, while the earth, uh, sorry, and, and the Lord smelled this aroma and the Lord said in his heart, this was the heart of God for man, I'm not going to bring this judgment to bear like this again. The, the next world judgment, as I said, will be by fire. It is written about in 2 Peter 3 for about 10 verses or so. But knowing the temporary nature of our world should change the way we live. So we should realize God loves us, has grace, but he's holy and he's going to judge again. People go, how could God send people to hell? Look, no, God's not sending anybody to hell. God's saying, come to heaven. Remember what he said? Come on to the ark. The Lord's not sending anybody to hell. You can go there if you want. But you'll have to step over the body of Jesus to get there. For now, God's word to Noah is, while the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest time, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night it shall not cease. For now, there will be seasons and cycles and normalcy while the earth remains. By the way, prior to the flood, there were no seasons at all. It was just one temperate climate. But now there would be seasons and snow and rain and, and true to this day while the earth remains. So what can you do? Well, you can be Noah in a horrible generation, people that are constantly and, and purposefully walking away from the Lord. I, I, I can't believe in the, in the 50 years I've been saved or almost. Wow. Anyway, in the last 50 years, um, how bad things have gotten in our culture, just in our generation, in our culture. The best thing you can do is come to Jesus, who will save you from the judgment to come. And know this, he wants you on the ark. He wants you in his son. He made you for life. But don't think for a minute that it is beneath the Lord to bring judgment. He made us, and he will have the last word. But he invites you to come. His, his desire is to give you eternal life. And we should be telling everyone that will listen back. There's a way out. I'm glad the Lord loves us. Aren't you glad? Next week, we will, I think, go at, at chapter 9 and 10, where we'll get a chance to learn how did all the nations of the earth get formed. Um, it is well worth your time to study and to learn these truths. So read ahead and we'll see how far we get. Maybe we won't get that far, but we'll try. Father, thank you tonight for your word to us. And what, a, what an unbelievable thought that there came a day which caught the world by surprise. And within a, a couple of days, everything that moved upon the earth would be dead that man had become so wicked that his thoughts were only evil continually, that his, his, his demonic involvement, his violent nature, his selfish ways, his unwillingness to listen, God, to your goodness, even just it is a few 
you know, 1,600 years, and, and the history was so replete with your goodness, with your power. Everyone could have read and known who you are and what you've done. And yet, as Noah preached for 120 years, no one, no one listened. But you were faithful. And to this one family, which found grace in your sight, seen righteous in your eyes, they were delivered from your judgment. Father, that we in this last days, as we realize these are certainly the days of Noah, that we would be the faithful generation, boldly holding out your word, tolerating the, <laughs> the persecution that will come because we believe in you in simple faith, that we will overcome evil with good and love those whom you love, and not take personally the, the slander that comes our way for our faith, because we read that, Lord, if they hated us, they hated you first. And the only reason we have to hear these things is because we choose to belong to you and obey you, as Noah did for his 120 years of life there. Thank you, Lord. What an example he was. May we follow suit. And this, this evening you find yourself maybe less committed as, than you once were. Maybe you started off in a blaze of glory, but now you find yourself kind of growing cold, sitting away from the fire, not so, not so moved by faith, not so hopeful in God's word, not so confident that he will do as he said. Look, this is a good time to move closer to the fire to go sit in his presence, to ask the Lord to renew in you that fire that once burned bright. I don't know how many times Noah had to go back to the well and say, Lord, I'm tired. I don't think we're going anywhere. No one's listening. And how often the Lord had to revile his heart. But I do remember hearing the Lord say to him when it was all over, you're righteous, come into the ark. You've done that which is right in God's sight. May God do that in your life. May the joy and the, and the hope and the, and the boldness of a relationship with Almighty God fill your heart. May someone in your neighborhood and in your circle of friends and your family hear about the God who loves them so from you. Because another judgment is coming. And we know about it, and we have no right to keep it to ourselves. And the Lord loves the world that he made. So go tell somebody. May it be the priority of your life. Because one day when you stand before Jesus, you'll be glad of those eight hours and, and months that you spent sharing and praying and even suffering for his name's sake. You'll be grateful and thankful that you were faithful. God is pleased with you and I as we make ourselves available to him. May God use you this week. For as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the appearing of the Son of Man.